let's go out there and chill and be good. Uh, I'm David Crossley. I'm the president of Houston tomorrow, and I thank you all for coming again. We have a, a lot of events uh, that, that we hope will lead to people doing better things in Houston over time, that we will all learn something about how the world could be. And, uh, and this is a part of our long distinguished speaker series. We've had probably mm, 20 or so speakers come down over the, over the years. Uh, some of them authors like Ben Ross here. And, um, and their books help us figure out what to do next. And so we're, we're always thrilled to do this. I think the most important thing we do is get people together to hear, <coughs> hear about things and talk about things and move on to the next place. So we have some more of those things coming up right away. Uh, we have this series called Ask the Expert Breakfast, where you can come have breakfast with somebody who's doing something fantastic. The next one is going to be on September 16th, and it'll be with Michael Emerson. You know Michael Emerson? He's, he's at the Kinder Institute. He's the co-director of the Kinder Institute, about to, about to not be the co-director because they're getting a, an incredible new director of that whole thing over there at Rice, a guy named Bill Fulton who is a vice president of Smart Growth America and a former mayor of Ventura, California, and the current planning director of San Diego. And we'll have him sometime in October come and do some stuff with us. But that's going to transform our city to have a guy like that here working all the time. And Michael will become the uh, something like academic director. Michael's a brilliant guy who was smart enough to get himself a year sabbatical in Copenhagen to study how Copenhagen is different from Houston. <laughs> so he's back now, and we're going to start doing some some talks and so forth. So he's going to do this Ask, Ask the Expert Breakfast on the 16th of September, and you can see find that on our website, or you can pick up John Lewis's card up by the door and find out about that. I think we still have a few seats left. It's a really interesting, it's a, it's a kind of an intimate little thing where there's only 30 people and the speaker only speaks for 10 or 15 minutes, and then everybody just talks and you exchange with them. It's a, it's a, it's a really great discussion for them. And it costs 50 bucks. Uh, so then, not long after that, on the 25th, we will have another distinguished speaker event with Michael Emerson, and that will be free, like this one. So, watch for that. On the 24th, every fourth Thursday, uh, Wednesday, every fourth Wednesday of the month, we have a, an event we call Livable Houston that we've been doing since 1999. And um, it's over at the Houston Galveston Area Council. And this month it's going to be a guy named Shafiq Rifat. Some of you, some of you architects might know him. And he's been working for a long time on a, on a, a concept he calls the modern city revisited. I mean, redesigned. And it's close to my heart stuff, really beautiful stuff having to do with garden cities and how you can build things. So, so, and that's free. It's at noon at HJC, so again, watch that. Uh, and then on October 1st, I hope all of you will put that on your calendar to come to our Catalyst Awards uh, that will be happening on uh, October 1st at 6.30, I think, at, um, at the Centerpoint Energy Plaza downtown. We will release tickets for that next week, so if you're on our mailing list already, you'll, you'll get an offer for that. But <coughs> if you're not on our mailing list, please get on. Excuse me. <coughs> Cracker. Oh, wait. I've always thought it was just thrilling that the place where a person's going to stand with some water is slanted. <coughs> <laughs> And then that will happen on October 1st, and that will be our Catalyst Awards. We started that last year where we gave awards to people who we judged to be serious catalysts, people who were changing things in Houston. We selected 12 <coughs> finalists, and then we selected three winners, and everybody came, and it was an incredible event. And it was, I remember we had this new logo, which some of you may have seen, and it's sort of a brain with things happening inside of it. And we were trying to get people to think about thinking. And so we, when we had that event, you kept seeing this brain up on the screen against the black background. It kept changing colors and pulsing. It was amazing. Hoping somebody would grasp that concept. 
And the first tweet that came out of that, half an hour after the event, was this guy saying, I've never been in a room so full of big brain people. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll happen again on October 1st. Please plan to go. Tonight, we're really excited to have Ben Ross come here. Ben is traveling around doing a tour about his book right now. And by the way, the book, be sure you get one on your way out. If you don't already have one, and Ben, I assume, will sign some. Yes, that one we're finished here. And Ben, uh, we're really jealous of what he has done because he has done a big transit coalition in Maryland that, was, that has really kicked some butt. And we've not quite been able to put that together here. So maybe we'll keep him around for a few days and move to Houston. That wouldn't probably happen. Anyway. But so Ben has written this book called Dead End, and, and it's uh, and it's uh, amazing, you know, how, how uh, th this idea that, that sprawl is dead and that suburbia is over can keep being a really interesting subject. And Ben has done it big time. But Ben does it by saying, "But here's the good stuff." <laughs> and so, uh, so Ben, why don't you just come up and tell us? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I was fascinated to hear that Bill Fulton is uh, coming to Houston. Uh, one of uh, the best anecdotes in my book, it, uh, not one I'm going to talk about tonight, is stolen from his book about Los Angeles. Uh, um, and. Uh, it's also very appropriate to be here in this nonprofit building because my experience in this comes from being the leader of a volunteer group. And I thought I'd really start off by talking about how I came to write the book. Uh, and uh, you'll see it's a story that has certain things in common with what has gone on in Houston and is continuing to go on. Uh, I live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., in Maryland. And in 1986, uh, the CSX Railroad abandoned a freight spur that carried coal into D.C. to heat government buildings. <clears throat> and it ran through the center of two very lively suburban downtowns that already had quite a bit of density and were very walkable. And so the then governor of Maryland uh, <clears throat> proposed, that said that he would build with state money a four mile light rail line connecting these two uh, stations, these two uh, downtowns, which were both on, both had stations of the Washington Red Line on different branches uh, that had just opened at that point. And he was also, he was the former mayor of Baltimore, and he was also building a light rail line in Baltimore. Uh, our county has uh, very slow moving uh, zoning and land use approval processes. So by the time this light rail line had been added to our master plan, the line in Baltimore had started construction, had overrun its budget, and had used up all the money for our line. <laughs> so we had a, uh, uh, <clears throat> we managed to get the state then to start the environmental studies to qualify this project for federal funding. Uh, there, there was a problem, however. The light rail right-of-way, which the county had, the you know, rail right-of-way, freight rail, which the uh, county had bought for the light rail, runs through the middle of the golf course of one of the most expensive country clubs in the Washington area. <laughs> and so they uh, went on the war path against it, uh, along with some of the more expensive neighborhoods that the line runs through. And in 1994, we elected a county executive who was against the project, and a county council that was for it, only five to four, with one of the five saying, well, it will be needed in 10 years, but not now. <clears throat> Nearly everybody gave the project up for dead at that point. Uh, however, we had a uh, citizen group which had been started to promote this project in 1986 uh, that had, you know, 50, 70 members and about 
eight or ten active people who went around speaking at meetings and so on. And uh, I had joined it a few years after it started. The, the president of the group and founder said, you know, you know, we no longer have the political backing. We need to build a coalition to build this thing. And uh, he asked me, he said, he asked me to become the president of the grassroots group. He said, the coalition will do all the work now. You won't have to do much work. Right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so we started working on uh, really two levels. One was building up the coalition. And at first it was a pretty threadbare coalition. We had uh, th this light rail route is suburb to suburb, and it actually runs parallel to the Washington Beltway, which is uh, extremely congested. And there was talk of widening it. So the civic associations along the Beltway were supporting the light rail line as an alternative, and they were active in it. Uh, we had basically lip service from the business community, a little bit more than lip service from the labor unions. I mean, the business community thought it was a fine idea, but didn't think it was going anywhere. Basically, people thought it was dead. Um, and so we reached out to public opinion, and we, uh, uh, part of this was that the country club was acting behind the scenes. And, uh, uh, we thought that, uh, you know, people really understood that this thing, which is really very popular, is being held up by a very small group of people. Uh, the opposition, the political opposition will melt away, which was, had some truth to it, but less so than I would have, than I had thought. Uh, <clears throat> but we did everything possible to put the country club front and center. Uh, and at one point I ran into the lobbyist for the country club at a political fundraiser. And he says to me, you know, my mother really doesn't like what you guys are saying about me. <laughs> and I said, your mother should love what we say about you. All we talk about is how highly paid you are. <laughs> uh, in, uh, uh, we also uh, worked at politics bef before the uh, 1998 primary, our county is strongly democratic, we passed out scorecards rating the candidates at the metro stations. By this point, the metro station, the, uh, in our suburban county, which now has a million people, there were about 25,000 people a day getting on the metro in the morning. And we discovered that if you're promoting a transit project and you stand in front of the station passing out flyers, you are laser targeting your supporters. And we got a new uh, county council that supported the project six to three, with one of the six thinking our scorecard was his ma margin of victory. People really paid attention to it. Uh, and so the day after they were sworn in, they sent a letter to the state asking them to resume the environmental studies. So uh, at this point, Paris Lendening, who was our governor then, had, was getting into the issue of smart growth. And due to the uh, light rail project had grown from a four mile line connecting these two downtowns into a 14 mile line through two counties, still all suburban. Uh, but in addition to these two big downtowns, it stopped in the middle of the largest Hispanic community in the Washington area. Then it will go through the middle of the campus of the University of Maryland. It will actually have a stop right at the foot of the steps of the Student Union. Uh, it will uh, wind up at the uh, New Carrollton, which is a station on the rail line from New York to Washington. Uh, and it will connect to four different branches of the Washington Metro. It's really, for, as a transportation planner, it's a dream that you have all these, play, all these things lined up in a straight line. And not only that, you have a, on the four miles of it that goes through the most expensive real estate, you already own a, re, a right of way which is completely grade separated, or well, almost completely and will be completely It'll be, with two more bridges, it will be completely grade separated, so it will go the four miles with the most riders 
uh, without any anything crossing it. Um, so in 2001, uh, Governor Glendening announced he was going to build it. And at this point, the business people got fully engaged, the labor people got fully engaged. After quite a bit of work, we had all the environmental organizations lined up behind it. And so we had this coalition consisting of business, labor, environmentalists, um, minority groups. Uh, we actually had more civic associations on our side than against, although not the most influential. Uh, and all my previous experience in politics says that when all these people are for something, it's going to happen. Uh, but that's not what happened. And uh, I think you uh, have similar experiences in Houston <laughs> and many other cities. And really, the purpose of my book is to try to understand why is it that this stuff is so hard to get done. Not just transit, uh, walkable development, stuff without parking. It's just so hard to get done. There's market demand for it. Why is that? But before I get to that, I don't want to leave you hanging, so I'll tell you the rest of the story of our light rail line called the Purple Line. In 2002, we elected a new governor who was against the project. The uh, business people prevailed on him to uh, not kill it entirely, but he, they spun wheels for four years uh, studying alternatives that no one really thought made any sense. Uh, the main one involved running buses 50 miles an hour on a two-lane road in front of an elementary school. Um, <coughs> It became a major, major issue in the 2006 election for governor of Maryland. Uh, governor Ehrlich had allowed himself to be quoted in the newspaper saying it will not go through the country club. So Martin O'Malley, who was then running for governor, was had the great opportunity of you know, campaigning for the 99% against the 1% with the Chamber of Commerce on his side. So that was... Uh, uh, but it still took quite a bit of courage because this country club was in fact very tied into his fundraising base. But he did take the issue on and he won the election. And it again became a big issue in the rerun in 2010. Uh, where it stands now is the uh, Maryland legislature last year raised the gasoline tax statewide by 20 cents a gallon. Uh, with the number one purpose being to build this light rail line and a parallel light rail line in Baltimore. Uh, the uh, president's budget, these are being built in Maryland. Uh, I'm going to make you envious. Uh, these projects are basically built by state money and federal money. Uh, it's actually innovative. They have asked the localities for these two light rail lines to 10% of the price, uh, in, and we get to count of the, the uh, right-of-way that we bought. Uh, so uh, in the President's budget in March, this project was recommended for $900 million of federal funding with $100 million to come next fiscal year. It's going to be built by a public-private partnership, which is basically a uh, financing mechanism. Uh, and the uh, RFP has just been issued. Uh, proposals are due, I think, in January, and if all goes well, construction will start later next year. But it has been a long, hard slog, and it's been the kind of slog, as I said, that you folks are quite familiar with. And people have, of course, noticed how hard this stuff is to get done, and there are a lot of explanations that people have put forward. Uh, and they all have some truth to them, but I don't find any of them satisfying as an explanation of why it just keeps again and again being so hard. Uh, one thing you hear is that resistance to change is just human. And of course there's some truth to that. 
But if you look, there was really a change around 1970 where things got a lot harder to get done in land use changes. And human nature obviously did not change in 1970. Uh, another thing you hear is that, you know, you've got all this opposition from the highway lobby, from, you know, subdivision developers, but I think anybody who looks at this realistically can see that there is plenty of grassroots resistance too. Uh, a third thing you hear is that people are trying to defend their property values by stopping change. Uh, and for that, I recommend people come to a place, uh, actually one stop from me on the Washington Metro called Friendship Heights. This was probably the hardest fought master plan in the history of our county. Uh, what stands there now, along with uh, some other uh, buildings, there's a row of stores next to each other, uh, Tiffany, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, and Bulgari, right next to each other. And nobody thought that was going to lower their property values. <laughs> um, you'll hear that, well, resistance to building comes from the growth of environmentalism. And again, of course, there's a connection there. But uh, you see things like people fighting to preserve parking lots. I, can, I have a, set, a couple of examples in the book. Uh, and uh, clearly, preserving parking lots is not environmentalism. Uh, and of course, people complain about traffic. Uh, but you'll notice that usually the people who are complaining the most about the traffic that some transit-oriented development will bring are the same people insisting that it must have more parking. So I think that there has to be a different answer to explain how pervasive this is. And my conclusion is that what we're really looking at is a clash between two value systems. Over more than a century in this country, we have built up a value system which holds living in a single family house and moving around by automobile to be socially superior to other forms of living. And um, usually that's subtext, you know, kind of unspoken, behind the scenes. Sometimes it comes out in the open. Uh, we just rewrote our zoning code in our county. Uh, one of the hot issues was whether to allow people to raise chickens in their backyards on small lots. Someone came to the public hearing and said that allowing hen houses, they weren't going to allow roosters for obvious reasons, uh, that allowing hens in backyards was, quote, a cultural slap in the face at the African-American community. She said, we grew up poor in the South. We had chickens in the backyards uh, because we needed to to feed our families. You know, now we've made it. We came to the suburbs. We don't want to be reminded of that. Uh, another place you can see this is in the complaints that drivers have about bicycles in the roads. If you look at anyone who's done actual statistical surveys of who rides a bicycle to work, a very large percentage is people who don't have a car either because they can't afford one or because they're undocumented and can't get a license. But when drivers complain about bicyclists, you never hear them complaining about those bicyclists. You hear them complaining about the people wearing spandex. Because the middle class person wearing spandex is kind of saying, my bicycle is equal to your car. Where the person riding down the sidewalk on their beat up bike you know, to get to work is not challenging them. Now there's another layer that has come on top of that uh, since the late 1960s or early 70s. And that is that our whole economy has changed. Uh, we once had an economy based on mass production and you know, advertising was the hard sell. And we shifted to an economy based much more on branding. You know, people used to go into a clothing store and feel the fabric. Now they go into the clothing store and look at the design.
designer label. And I believe that that has affected real estate too. Uh, people have neighborhood brands that you want to defend. Um, you know, I don't know Houston well enough to specify the neighborhoods, but uh, in uh, it's interesting. They, they somewhat different in different places in Chicago. In these old ethnic neighborhoods that have gentrified, they're very into uh, preserving the ethnic brand of the neighborhood. So you have a neighborhood called Andersonville that used to be Swedish. Uh, it's now very gentrified. The Swedish population in the last census was, I think, 2%. But they have a big St. Lucia Days parade with drag queens. <laughs> uh, another neighborhood in Chicago uh, called Argyle, a uh, uh, hundred years ago it was a Jewish immigrant neighborhood. And then it became kind of Asian, mixed Asian, but mostly heavily Vietnamese. And they've, it's at an earlier stage of gentrifying, but they've kind of adopted Vietnamese as the neighborhood brand. Uh, and a sociologist who wrote about this, there's still a synagogue, and a sociologist interviewed the rabbi. And the rabbi said, talking about the street where his synagogue is, he says, you know, this isn't really the right place for a kosher deli. This street should have Vietnamese stores. Um, now, part of this neighborhood branding also involves politics. What you, you know, different neighborhoods have sort of different political images. And typically, the people who are most opposed to any kind of change in the neighborhood uh, adopt uh, a kind of more extreme and purest version of whatever the dominant politics is in that neighborhood. So in Colorado, there was a Tea Party candidate for governor who said that bike share in Denver was a United Nations plot. Uh, but if, in Berkeley, California, the leading opponent of bike lanes is a socialist feminist. Um, so, thinking about all this, uh, it raises the question, you know, what practically can we uh, do or learn from this? And I think uh, there are a few lessons that I want to talk about, practical lessons. Uh, one is to just understand and appreciate that people who are against transit line or against transit-oriented development are concerned about status. And it's legitimate, I mean, to be concerned. In politics, you know, you're, you're entitled to what, ask for what you want to ask for, within reason. And so it's, you should make appeals that reinforce these, show how this thing that you want will raise social status, will improve the neighborhood, and really, this came out of our experiences with the light rail line, the purple line. Uh, one end of it is in Bethesda, Maryland, which has become the big center of nice restaurants in Washington. It really has displaced Georgetown as the center <coughs> of nice restaurants. So further to the east along this line, uh, what really resonated with people was saying, you'll be able to take the purple line to have dinner in Bethesda. Now, people will do that, but it is not going to be a major percentage of the ridership. But it's something that everyone can see how it benefits them, it will benefit their neighborhood. Uh, in Bethesda, the residential parts of Bethesda are past the end of the line, so nobody in Bethesda will be riding it to downtown Bethesda where the restaurants are. But what we uh, found really grabbed people in Bethesda was we said uh, Georgetown, turned down having the metro, look what happened to them. You don't want Bethesda to go the same way. Uh, Georgetown is still, the residential parts of Georgetown are still every bit as nice as they ever were. But the uh, restaurant scene in Georgetown has turned into more of a uh, students drinking beer on the weekends than a fine dining thing. And people kind of instinctively understand in Washington that that's 
a consequence of not having a metro station there. It made it less attractive as an urban walkable area. Um, a second thing is that broadening the decision making. You have <coughs> really in order over the years we built up this system in this country and it works differently in Houston than in other places but you've got it here uh, where in order to protect these small neighborhoods from change you have a very local decision making and what you have to see what you have to do is if, when there are big decisions to be made that affect the entire community the entire community should get to participate. That is, in fact, much more democratic than having the decision made by adding up a, a whole string of small decisions among, made between a builder and the immediate neighbors. Uh, of course, the neighbors are entitled to input on the specifics, but the big decisions of are we going to build transit lines, for example, should be made by the entire community, including the people who are going to ride the transit line, and not just the people who are going to see it out of their windows. Um, and the, the, a good example of that, I was just talking to someone, uh, Arlington, Virginia, I have a third of a chapter in the book, is about the uh, Carter, where the metro goes through Arlington, Virginia, which is really a, you know, the, really the country's premier example of transit-oriented development outside of the city downtown. What they did was, when the Washington metro was being planned, the city said the planners wanted to put it down the middle of the interstate because that would be cheapest, but the county said, uh, no, we want it to go uh, underground, under a street that actually has quite a bit of, had quite a bit of resemblance to Richmond here. And they, <clears throat> they passed a bond referendum, which passed, I think, 60-40 or 65-35, to spend a couple hundred million dollars extra, and this is from a county of a quarter million people, to put it underground. And the whole idea was that this kind of, uh, what was then kind of decaying commercial strip would be redeveloped around the metro stations. Now, once they started adopting their master plans for what they were going to build around the metro stations, there started to be a lot of opposition. But the big decision had already been made. The voters had voted to invest a quarter billion dollars in putting this thing underground. And so the discussion had to be, okay, what are we going to build here? Not, are we going to build here? And it's, much, it's really more democratic to have the big decision be made by the entire electorate and then have smaller groups work out the details. Um, so with that, I think I want to finish. I, um, a couple people read, I, I wound up uh, one chapter of my book with a comment about planning and planners. Said it's a little bit like the job of a bouncer in a nightclub. A suburban planner, you know, wants the tax revenue, uh, but doesn't want the uh, unprestigious people coming in. So the guy that buys a lot of champagne gets a nice table. And you sort of balance that, it's like the, uh, office building that nobody really wants but is going to pay a lot of taxes. And um, so with that, I think I will wind up. I would love to take discussion. Uh, and there are books available to sale, I'll be for sale. And I'll be happy to sign them. Thank you. I had heard 25 years ago that there was no transit system in the world that could pay for itself through ridership, through 
what your ticket fee. I haven't kept up with it in the meantime, but the purple line, is it, it, it does it have to be heavily subsidized? The construction, actually, I think the, uh, the, the, uh, I haven't seen the latest numbers, but earlier numbers were that the uh, operations would be pretty well paid. I think 80, the Washington Metro Rail uh, pays about 80% of its operating costs out of fares. Uh, the purple line, I believe, it, I don't know if this is still true, but at one point they were calculating that the subsidy, the, um, the subsidy would be less than the subsidies they would save by reducing the number of buses that go on the route. Um, it's, but it's, it, the purple line is an unusually, really unusually good route. Um, there are bus routes in Washington that make money, but the system doesn't. And the, pro the reason is that the streets are subsidized. You know, you can't make money competing with something that's given away for free. Uh, and so, yes, all forms of transportation are subsidized. Um, uh, long distance, you know, airplanes, much less so, but somewhat. High speed rail, uh, there's a couple people who think they can make money building rail lines, although they make it uh, at least the one, in, I don't know about the one in Texas, but the one in Florida, the guys that basically they already own the railroad, they're going to make money on the real estate that's going to gain value. They're, they're hoping to break even on the actual high-speed rail and make money on from all the land they own around the stations. But, you know, the reality is roads are very heavily subsidized. Gasoline taxes don't pay anything like the cost of maintaining and building the whole road system. And if you're going to compete with something that's free, you know, you're not going to make money. Yeah, I guess it's very difficult to add in all the cost and benefit. Yeah. But the question, I guess my question is, um, when you're selling a system, an enormous cost to a community, taxpayers, uh, what was the pitch that you made? Other than, I mean, if you, you couldn't, you, if you couldn't, sell it on the basis of, of profitability, let's say, that it was going to pay for itself through right or oh, Well, the, pit, the number one pitch is you're not going to be stuck in traffic on the Beltway. <laughs> okay. That, that was the number one pitch, no question. Uh, the number two pitch is, you, you know, really, I mean, people in Bethesda don't go to sports events at University of Maryland on weeknights traffic so bad, I mean, you just don't. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, and we have the metro system, which no one in Washington thinks was a mistake. So even the people who are against the Purple Line say, oh, we're for mass transit, this isn't just, a, this just isn't the right place for it. We have, you know, it's a very different debate than it is here. Yeah. Um. I hadn't been in the D.C. area since the mid-90s, but uh, back then they only had one line that went to, I think, Reagan Airport. Do you have lines that go to all three airports now, and are they heavily traveled? Uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, to BWI, there's a commuter rail line. I, had, I was doing some fundraising for our organization, and they uh, last uh, November, and Someone said, why can't they run those commuter trains on the weekends? And I got to say, it starts a week from Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, commuter trains to BWI Airport from both Washington and Baltimore, and also light rail from Baltimore to BWI. Uh, Dulles Airport, uh, the uh, metro extension is under construction. They have just opened the first phase of it, which goes through Tyson's Corner and to Reston, and the second phase is now starting construction. Do you see a lot of ridership for the ones that are finished? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the airports are a good destination, but uh, valuable, but you shouldn't overestimate their importance. It's uh, 
you know, that, that I'm a great believer that a rail line, first and foremost, has to go places where people want to go. And then once you've got your system in place that connects the main places where people want to go and helps those densify, then you start build, you know, uh, then you can build lines that uh, promote, that, whose main purpose is to promote real estate development. But it won't really promote the real estate development very well unless it goes to the places where people are already going. That, that's my own view of it. So when you're getting started, you really need to look for connecting the major centers. And I rode the red line today, and you know, connecting the medical center to downtown is such an obvious thing. It, uh, you know, it makes it clear why the red line is such a success. The other thing that I noticed is the trains run really often. And that's really important. But that's in large measure because you have enough riders to make it worthwhile to run them off. Yeah? yeah? You said in the early days that um, you got lift service from the business community and a little bit better than that from the unions, but later they were engaged. So how did you make that transition? Well, what really happened was uh, we've got the governor behind it. And then, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here he's going to Japan to talk about high-speed rail. Uh, but yeah, the governor got behind it. You know, it just looked like a dead project. And then once it became a even, you know, they started getting involved. Once we got the county council to send the letter, uh, asking the state, and the state did start the process again, they got more involved. You know, it, it, they were never had any problem with the substance of it. It was just they didn't think it was going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Were all alternatives to rail considered like streetcars? Um, not well. Bus bus was considered, but uh, the, the official study had. Uh, three bus options. Two of them went on the same route as the rail. And the people who didn't like it, uh, for them, the bus was even worse than the rail on that route. So they were promoting the third one, which went, uh, um, <clears throat> on this, you know, small roads and kind of, you know, it was an excuse for not uh, building the other one. And then there were, there were oh, pe uh, politicians were against, they proposed an elevated line above the beltway, they proposed an underground line outside the beltway. Uh, you know, when I'm talking about this topic, I'm the only person who can say inside the beltway, and it's not a cliche. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> they proposed a, a, a route outside the beltway, underground, that had no right of way for it, would it have to be underground at a cost of two or three times more than our project, which is turning out to cost two billion? Um, you know, there were lots of things thrown around, but they were always of the nature of the grass is greener on the other side. If you, when you started really looking at them, they had big flaws. I, I mean, we, just having this freight rail line with most of the bridges already built over it on the major roads connected going right between the centers of the two, these two, the two biggest employment centers in the county. That's just such an asset that uh, it just dwarfs, it, it just forces you, you know, any rational planning into that group. Yeah. So I was just in Boston for four days and my wife and I would just do whatever we wanted to. So we were looking around and and it took a day or so to realize that everywhere we wanted to go, the trolley tours would go. You know, but these were rubber tires, they were buses, yeah. you know, calling themselves trolleys. And they were totally focused, all their routes were taking tourists where they want to go. And then the system that's in place, the municipal, the MBTA and so forth, which is terrific, is kind of hard to get to those places. And you wonder if there's something there, some market thing, where somebody's figuring out, okay, this is where everybody wants to go, and we'll only go there, as opposed to whatever it is that the public utility, like, like the transit system, goes to places for political reasons. 
I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Washington Metro does go to all the tourist places. And it was kind of designed, you know, it was funded mostly by the feds. And the I, part of the appeal was all your constituents in Congress are going to be able to come to Washington and ride it. Um, and it's, uh, but you're right about Boston. The, the, the tourists don't take it as much, although it does go to <coughs> You know, the Boston system is, you know, the, one of the tunnels is 117 years old. Uh, and it was built up piece by piece. Uh, so it, it's, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a good system, but it's, uh, you know. Well, and I should have said, uh, both systems. Those trolley, trolleys were completely full all day long, yeah. all the time. But so was the MBTA, yeah. but doing something different. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, I mean, the Washington system gets a lot of money from tourists. I mean, we, we, in fact, they have the new, they, they changed the fares so that the elect, you have to pay a dollar a ride extra if you buy a paper fare card. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the soap for tourists. <laughs> Yeah. You get on uh, bicycle commuting a little bit early on. Yeah. I'm curious, in the uh, Washington metro area, uh, back in the 90s again, uh, the price of gas spiked up around 97, 98, and they had so many cyclists on the WOD trail that the, the cops were giving tickets for anybody going over 15 miles an hour. <laughs> Has the community, have the communities there done anything about a more robust bicycle infrastructure or is that something that's still an afterthought? Oh no, Washington, D.C. Uh, distinguished D.C. from my suburban county, which is the traffic engineering people in my suburban county are in the dark ages. <laughs> but in D.C., they have put the amazing stuff. There is a bike path protected with pylons uh, down the middle of, Connecticut, of Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol to the White House. Wow. Um, and uh, there's a network of uh, separated bike paths through that through downtown, which is getting expanded. This has all happened within the last uh, four or five years. Uh, we uh, we have really about the most successful bike share system in the country. Um, the, the bike the docks are everywhere downtown. Um, it, it's enough that it there's some feeling that it's one of the, it's hurt the ridership on the metro. Do you see lockers and uh, showers and other types of infrastructure storage facilities for the cyclists as well? Yeah, there's some of that. The, the Metro, uh, uh, they've actually started at a few stations. They've now got these uh, bike storage. At a few Metro stations, they have these uh, indoor bike storage facilities that are like two level, that can store like 200 bikes or 300 bikes. and. The new line that just opened to Dulles there, uh, to Tyson's Corner, um, <clears throat> at the McLean Station, uh, it doesn't have any uh, park and ride because Tyson's Corner is really more of a uh, job destination than a housing origin. But the McLean Station is a developer that had a land that he was planning to build on later. And everyone in the newspapers was complaining there were no, there's no parking. There's not going to be any parking. Where am I going to park? So uh, this developer asphalted over his parking lot, you know, had a parking lot, I think, left over from some building that had been knocked down. So he put in 600 parking spaces, uh, which he's not charging much for, because the, the uh, commuter parking at the park and rides in the Washington Metro is $5 a day. Um, so he uh, put in... 700 parking spaces, and then Metro had uh, 70 bike parking spaces at the station. The bike parking station spaces are oversubscribed. Uh, there are only 100 cars parking there out of the 700 spaces. Now, some of the other end of the line stations, uh, our Shady Grove station has, I think, uh, 3,000 or 4,000 parking spaces. 
humongous. Yeah. Someone else? Yeah. I remember uh, this is back in the 70s when they were first building, they first started building or had built some of the uh, Metro line in Washington, D.C. We were, I was in Washington and I rode the, the rail to the Redskins game in the Baltimore station, right? Was it, where would no. it have been? No, the Redskins game then would have been at Stadium Armory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the green line. And it was really great. You just get off and walk in, walk to the stadium right there. And of course, when they were building the red line here, I was hoping that it would go into the parking lot of uh, NRG Stadium, but the people who were building the stadium didn't want it in there. Yeah, well, the, 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 the uh, baseball stadium, the baseball stadium in Washington uh, <coughs> is right on the green line and close in. So they get, uh, you know, I mean, they have much more people go to the baseball games in Washington by metro than by car. And they had, you know, they put in a lot of parking and found they weren't, nobody was using it. Uh, <coughs> the, the new football stadium is like a 20, is out in the suburbs, it's like a 20 minute walk from the station. Um, just to actually comment on your last point. I lived in DC for the last seven years and went to George Sherman, so I'm familiar with that. But um, commenting on the whole idea about like Metro working with um, the baseball teams or to work with those uh, other like sports outlets. So anytime there's a game that's late, uh, for example, so if you're going to Stadium Armory and you expect that the game is going to be late, if they know the game is going to be late, usually they contact Metro and they have a deal with Metro in order to pay them more so that the ridership doesn't go down and that their um, constituents are still able to, and customers are still able to um, be at the event and then still Metro still gets paid. Yeah, they, they, uh, the, the Washington Metro uh, closes kind of early. The last train goes through downtown at, at midnight, but now they keep it open until 3 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, Philadelphia is experimenting with service all night on weekends. Uh, Boston, when I lived there, they, you know, they always closed down 12.30, but now they're staying open later on the weekends. Uh, New York, of course, runs all night. Yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned there was, or is a commuter rail between Baltimore and Washington. Does that close? It, it used to close whatever they had was like eight o'clock or something. Yeah, it still does. It, it's That's uh, impossible. It's yeah, no, it's terrible. It's terrible. And we were hoping. I mean, one of the things that they did with this twenty cent gas tax increase. Uh, in fact, the first thing that happened was um, running the trains on the weekend, and we're quite disappointed that they haven't uh, run them. Later at night, they uh, of course you can from Baltimore you can take the Amtrak late at night, so. but when not from there, the, you know, the intermediate stations. You can't. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you know who Mr. Culberson is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I've heard> <laughs> He's the one that blocks our the black rail going down Richmond. Yeah, well, it gets paid by the contractors, the concrete people. Well, I um, and you're talking about. I'm not going to comment on that, but I <laughs> uh, found this fascinating story when I was researching the book in uh, 1951. The uh, until about 1970, the uh, railroads were the dominant force in a lot of state legislatures especially Pennsylvania, where the Pennsylvania Railroad was really strong. So they kept very strict weight limits on trucks. And there was this great, so the truckers were all lobbying. And it was, uh, so they, uh, I think right before the state election, around then, the, uh, 
Pennsylvania Truckers Association sends large checks to both the Democratic and Republican parties. <laughs> and there was a, uh, uh, you know, somehow there was an investigation and there was a trial. And the secretary testifies that, uh, was asked, isn't that somewhat like betting on both teams in a baseball game? And his answer was, yes, but it was all out in the open. <laughs> okay, well, this has really been a pleasure. Uh, I, I, it's great. I've been traveling to different cities and riding different light rail lines. And I have to tell you that the, that the red line is about one of the most successful of the new uh, light rail lines. It really is uh, a really great facility. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I would love to stick around and talk and sign books for people. Good. Thank you so much, Ben. I, you know, how we do this stuff, when I started doing this stuff in 1998, I, I was a photographer. I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. And what I still did was read books. And so I really encourage you to become a soldier in this thing and pick up a book. And one of the interesting things that Ben's giving us is, the, is this, what I think is the core of it all, which is the value clash. You know, and, and, and we have to be able to sort out something that has to do with a clash of value. For Okay, you get what you want, but we get what we want. And, uh, and I think we can, uh, we can learn how to do that. So, you know, buy a book. And we're not getting anything out of that. I'm just saying do it. Um, and, I, and, it, and it reminded me of uh, this whole thing with Culberson, of course, is like Robert Moses. Have any of you read the, the wonderful book about Robert Moses, how he made the bridges into New York be 13 feet so that a bus couldn't get through? Because they know the bus is coming into New York. You know, I mean, that's so diabolical. And that's exactly what, of course, John Culberson is trying to do, saying, when we do this uptown bus rapid transit line over here, we have to build this big flyover that's going to change everything. It can't be strong enough to support a rail line in the future. The Metro is supposed to sign off on that. Yeah. Even though we voted for a rail line there, and Metro's chairman, to his credit, is saying, I'm not going to sign that. There's a sacred trust here we have with the voters. And so on. So we're going to have to support that decision here in the next few days. You're going to start to see some media about it, and it's going to be a nasty fight. I want to tell one story. Good, yeah, please do. <laughs> we had a Maryland State Legislature who was uh, the uh, fiendish opponent of the Purple Line. He actually got elected to the legislature. First became the chair of the committee against the, per against the light rail line when it was first proposed, <clears throat> uh, set up a PAC, raised lots of money from members of the country club, <clears throat> then, you, then ran for the legislature himself, but before he left the PAC, gave large contributions to members, of, key members of the legislature around the state so that once he was elected to the legislature, he went right into the leadership because all these people owed him favors. <clears throat> so he came along and um, he, uh, so he was there for years and in the legislature, le legislative leadership was always the biggest, you know, we were always having to watch out his maneuvers. So uh, after Governor Glendening proposed his light red line. Uh, this uh, delegate, John Herson, came back with the bus route that would go along the light rail line, same route for a while, and then go off on this street so it wouldn't go through the country club. And we looked at the map and said, hmm. Uh, so we printed up flyers, about 4,000 of them, that we went out one day and passed out at all the metro stations in that legislative district, pointing out that the, uh, 
there's a, the, the the appeal was we have we want the, we have a bike trail here. We don't want it to be a light rail line that will destroy the trail. So we printed it up leaflet saying Delegate Hurston wants to run diesel buses next to the trail up to a point one block before his house, at which time it will go off in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> and we passed out about 3,000 of them. And uh, I, I heard through the grapevine uh, that he was extremely annoyed about this. <laughs> I found <laughs> credible. <laughs> and, and it's always, it's always like that. There's strange things going on in the background that actually been talking this weekend with the chairman of Metro and, you know, I mean, so much anger about what went on in the referendum a couple of years ago and so much backroom stuff that it would make you sick. So I ask you to pay attention. And if you go to HoustonTomorrow.org and sign up for our newsletter if you don't already get it. And we're, we have a pro-transit campaign with RichmondRail.org and the Citizens Transportation Coalition. And we're trying, you know, I mean, if we can get, we've had a couple of moments where we got thousands of people signing petitions and it turned things around. And you have a petition on the website right now? We have a petition online right now. <coughs> can you find it from the homepage? I think you can find it from, I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a picture and so forth that takes you right to it. But pay attention to the newsletter. There's so much going on right now. And I'll tell you what, if you're one of the people who's saying, hey, wait, there's too much building going on. There's too much traffic happening. It's I can just say, look at New York, look at Manhattan. Completely successful people don't care if it's congested because they don't use their cars there. You know, so that's what's going to happen here sooner or later, and the sooner the better, I think, that we're able to get around with transit and not have to even think about it while we use our phones and fall asleep and do whatever we want to on the way to work. So thanks so much for coming. Please go buy it.